Back in April, I made a video about the official Arch Guided Installer, which was first included with the ISO back on April 1st. And because it was an absolute joke, I completely tore it apart. Now, some people said I was being too harsh on it, or some of the ways I caused it to crash were going to be the fault of the user. But if you enter a B instead of an A, and then your program crashes, that's not a problem with the user. That is a problem with the program. Now, this video became fairly popular. I think it's the most popular video on the Arch Guided Installer, so I felt like I had to do a follow-up. The dev saw that original video, and this dev, I have to say, is an absolute legend. He didn't agree with every single problem I brought up, but when it came to the usability issues and the bugs that it had, he was like, okay, I probably should fix this. This shouldn't have been released in the state that it was in. I gave him a couple of months to fix it, and you know what? If this the state it was originally in, that would have been a completely different video. The guided installer is actually good now. Let's go and have a look then. So if we go and run Arch install, Arch install is included with any version of the ISO after April 1st. You don't have to go and like download anything or anything like that. It'll just be there from the start. This will first bring up the keyboard layout selector. Now, if we go and press enter without including an input, that is going to select the US layout, which is perfectly fine. US layout is a fairly common keyboard layout. But if we go and enter, let's say, 27, which is outside of the range here, or 37, I guess, selected option is out of range. Good. Okay, let's go and enter a language that isn't in the list. Given language wasn't found. This is how it should have acted by default. Now, this isn't every single keyboard layout that is supported. If we go and enter the question mark key, that is going to bring us into a search prompt. Now, I do have one problem with the search prompt. It doesn't really indicate to you, besides starting with SV, what might actually be included. So, unless you already know the name of the thing you're looking for, finding something with this prompt really isn't going to be that easy, but if we actually go into that prompt and then we don't actually want to use it, typing exit is going to take us back to this first page where we can go and enter a language. For now though, we're just going to use the US layout. So the next step is going to get us to select the country to download our packages from, and obviously Australia being the best country is at the top. Now this has the same level of error handling that we saw in the first part. If we enter something outside of the range, we get that one, enter something not on the list, then we get that one. Works as it should, nothing else to really say about this. Next up is selecting the disk to install Arch on. So if we go and enter something out of the range, does that. Enter something that's not on the list, does that. Good, as we'd expect. But it also has the option where if you don't select a drive, it's going to use whatever is currently mounted at slash MNT and then use that to set up Arch. It does say it's experimental. I have not tested this myself, so I cannot confirm how well this is going to work, but most people are probably going to want to do a clean install. In my case, I'm going to go with Dev SDA, which is on option one. Then we get the option to go and select our file system. Error handling still works the exact same way. Now, I have a different problem with this than when I first talked about it, so... Previously, this was in alphabetical order, and that was fine with ButterFS being at the top. Now, it is not in alphabetical order, but ButterFS is still at the top. What that is implying to me is that that is being treated as the default option. Now, if you've ever read the Arch Linux documentation, you would know that ext4 is basically the standard way to set up your file system. It's not that ButterFS can't be used or ButterFS is bad, it's just not the default choice. I would personally put ext4 at the top or give it a label saying default. The reason why labels are going to be fine is because in later parts of the application, it is actually using a label for a default choice. One thing I hadn't tested before now is what happens if we don't enter an option. And as you can probably see here, not entering something is going to force us to actually select a value. I think that's a good way to handle it to make sure it doesn't pick a file system that you don't want to use. In my case, I am going to use ext4. I don't really care about using disk encryption, so I'm going to leave that blank. Then it's going to ask us for a host name. Let's go and set that one to Brody. Then we can set a root password, but if we go and leave that blank, then it won't actually have a root account. 
and as it says here, it's making a recommendation. So the developer isn't against making recommendations in places where they feel like they are useful, but doesn't make a recommendation when it comes to the file system. I am going to enter a root password just because I prefer to have a root account, but if you want to go with what the dev says, then you know, you can just not bother enabling it. That actually wasn't intentional, but if you do mess up your password, it will give you an error message. After that, if you want to have a user account, which you probably should, then you can go and add one. I am going to add one named Brody. I'm going to go and enter a password for that. And then once that is done, I believe... Okay, firstly, we can decide if it's going to be a sudoer. I'm going to make this a sudoer, so someone who can actually run sudo. And then it's going to prompt us to make any extra users. I'm just going to leave this blank and press enter. And then it's going to prompt us to actually set up our desktop profile. And this is actually a really cool feature. If you go through this step without selecting anything, you're still going to have some packages installed. I believe without anything selected, you'll get base and base devel and any of the other like basic required packages. But if you want to have, say, GNOME pre-installed, or i3, or KDE, or anything like that, you can go and select the desktop profile, and then select which one you want to use. But maybe you just want to have, say, just Xorg, or just the software useful on a server, well then you can go and select one of those instead. I'm going to go with the desktop option, just so I can show you a problem that it has. So this has a list of things that are pre-set up, they're perfectly fine options. I don't like that when you install i3, it installs it with a, uh, a display manager, but it's fine. It gets i3 working, that's all that matters. A problem here is uh, there's no way to go back. So there's no like exit command here, doesn't exist. If we just press enter, we can't do that. So from this point, we are stuck here. It probably should have the same exit option that we saw on the search earlier. For now though, I'm just going to install i3. Then it's going to prompt us for the version of i3. So any cases like i3, it will give you this option. I'm going to go with option zero for i3 gaps. And then it's going to prompt us for our graphics drivers. Now, on the minimal and server options, this prompt will not be shown because you're installing a minimal setup or you're installing something on a server. You don't necessarily need those drivers. One thing I should have mentioned before is previously the way that these categories up here were being handled was not at all. So things like I think KDE were at the top level rather than inside of the desktop profile. So this listing and these categories have been really cleaned up and they actually mean what you'd expect them to mean now. Now for the graphics driver section, this has really been cleaned up. So previously it was referring to the drivers based on the driver names, not the companies that the drivers were actually supporting. So now we have AMD, Intel, Nvidia, and then the VMware and VirtualBox option. I don't think that was in the list before. So in my case, I'm going to select that one, but there's one option in here that I don't understand all open source. So as we can see, a couple of the drivers are marked as being open source. Presumably what that means is it's going to install all of the open source drivers, but I don't know why you would do that because you wouldn't want to install drivers for a card that you don't have. I should mention that the NVIDIA option does include both the open source and the proprietary drivers, so you can select which one you want to use. It's not gonna just force you to pick the proprietary when you don't want them. Problem that we saw before though, is we can't go and exit out of this menu though. So I'm gonna get us back to this point so I can select the correct drivers. Once you've selected your drivers, this is a really cool addition. It's gonna prompt you to use either Pipewire or Pulse Audio. It's gonna install one of them by default. You can obviously remove Pulse Audio later if you don't want it, but this is just how it's going to do it. I personally don't like Pipewire in the state that it's in. So I'm gonna say no, but this is a really, really good option to have. Now, the next option is selecting which kernel you want to use, and this is where it gets kind of weird again. You can probably tell this interface is completely different from any of the ones we've seen before, and I feel like that is the biggest problem this application currently has. Some parts of the application work in some way where you can press exit to go back, some parts don't have an exit, then other parts like this one, you can go and enter values, and it keeps you on the screen 
until you go and press enter. So if I want to go and enable, say, like, the Harden kernel and the OTS kernel, I can go and do that. And then selecting the value again is going to go and disable that. For now, though, I'm just going to press enter to use the Linux kernel. Now we're at the point where we can select any extra packages we may want to download. So by default, you're going to get base, base devel, Linux, Linux firmware, and it says EFI boot manager, but that is a bug. So previously, this only worked on UEFI systems, but now this system right here, this, this VM I'm running, is running BIOS. And when you're using BIOS, it is going to install Grub. UEFI, it will use EFI Boot Manager though, so keep that in mind. Now, I know that most people are using widescreen monitors and not a 4x3 VM, but line breaks exist. On a 16x9 monitor, I don't want to read a line that goes across my entire screen. Just add a line break in after like base devel and it will be much easier to read. To download extra packages, we use a space separated list. So let's go and download Vim, Nano, and blah, 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 blah. And give it a second. It should go and error out and say, this package does not exist, but it doesn't tell you the other packages also don't exist. So it goes and checks that, okay, Vim, Nano, those are real. This one, what are you saying? For now, though, I'm just going to install Vim. So from here, it's going to go and verify that. Then we can go and select how we actually want to do our networking. If you've set up something custom in the ISO, you can go and copy those settings. You can go and download Network Manager and have that go and do everything for you. That's the way I prefer doing stuff. Or you can just say, hey, this is your network device. Set it up that this is the network device to be using. I'm not sure how that option is going to work. It might go and download something like DHCPD, but Network Manager is probably going to be the best thing to use. I'm going to enter one, and then we have to go and select a time zone. Now, time zones are still as broken as they used to be. They don't error out when you enter the wrong value, but there's no easy way to search for them. And as we saw earlier, there is clearly already a working search functionality, so that should probably be included here as well. Now, when it comes to the time zone, you can't just go and enter, you know, ACST, JST, PST, anything like that. UTC is an exception. You have to go and enter, you know, Australia slash Adelaide or Australia slash Brisbane. And there is an example of that being here, but if you're in some, like, weird sub-time zone, Having that search option there would be very useful. Once you've entered the time zone, it's going to prompt you to do NTP time synchronization. There's really no reason not to do this. I'm going to say why. And then it's going to prompt you to actually look at the things you've gone and set up. So I know that everything I've entered is fine. I'm going to press enter. And then it's going to go and start doing the installation. And this is where there has been another really, really nice change. So previously, <laughs> once you got to the, like, the installation bit, there was no output. So if it took 15, 20, 30, an hour, you actually wouldn't know how long it's going for. Now, as we can see, it just shows the Pac-Man output, and we can see how long stuff is taking to download. It is freaking out a little bit, but I think that's more about, uh, the TTY, not about the application itself. If it is the application, that probably should be fixed, but the fact there is output there is perfectly fine. Just to prove it is using Grub, as we can see right here, Grub is being installed right now, and I'll cut back to when it's actually done. Now, once it's finished installing everything, for me, it took about five or so minutes, it's then going to prompt you to go and to root into your new installed system. But if we go and press no, then we can go and just reboot and then open up the system like that. As you can see, no errors, we may now reboot. Removing the ISO and then starting up the system should go and start it up exactly the way we'd expect. So it's giving us a grub prompt. Okay, Arch Linux is being detected. And once that's gone and loaded, because I selected the i3 profile, we're going to be shown a, uh, a display manager. I don't like to see it, but it is going to show it. And here we are. I'm just going to log in as Brody and go and enter my password. And that should go and log in, assuming I didn't forget my password. Okay, we're good. i3 is working, so everything's working as it should be. 
as I said earlier, if this was a state that it was originally in when I first tested it, this video would not exist, and that video would have been very, very positive. The guy did install it in its current state, while I do have some issues with, you know, the weird UI stuff and the some slight usability issues it does have, overall, it is really, really good, and if this is the way that you install Arch, there is no problem with that whatsoever. I will be keeping up that previous video basically for historical purposes and to show what a dev can do if they are actually willing to listen to feedback. This went from being completely unusable to being an amazing application in a couple of months. Honestly, this is probably going to be the way that I install Arch from now on because I don't really care to go through the rest of the process. So if you like this video and you want to support the channel and become one of these amazing people over here, please go check out my Patreon subscribers down on the pay linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea available basically anywhere. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robertson Plays where I live stream twice a week, upload about five or so YouTube shorts, and this channel is also available over on Odyssey. That's going to be it for me, and I'm out.